Hello, my dears! Today we're going to talk about conservatorships, and I can't promise you it's going to be the most interesting or riveting thing in the world, but it will be as an important thing to know if you care about disability rights or if you are a person. Because uh, if, if you live long enough, you will become disabled, and that is only halfway a threat. In all seriousness, conservatorships are usually discussed in the sense of elder care, and the majority of elderly people are disabled, so I, I do genuinely mean that. Anyway, today we're going to go over what conservatorships and guardianships are, how they work, the concerns surrounding them, some of their history. Didn't find a whole ton about that, but got some tidbits. Some famous conservatorships in the media lately, and then alternative options and things to put in place to protect yourself and avoid conservatorships, because I watch an elder care webinar from the Michigan Attorney General, and I learned a lot about my and personal legal stuff and it was really helpful. I, I genuinely recommend sitting down and watching it. I will recommend it again in this video. It's at the top of the, my sources in the description. You're welcome. Also, we are going to be talking about legal lawyery stuff today. This is not legal advice at all. I'm not a lawyer. Um, just gathering facts and basic understanding of things from various sources to present to you in a cohesive format to get you started and then you should expand your knowledge from here. Okay, so what is a guardianship or a conservatorship? Both refer to a legal status where the court appoints someone to manage the affairs of someone who is either a minor or an adult who is somehow incapacitated, unable to give informed consent, and or in need of protection. Some states split them up into two things. One split is that a guardian is for a child and a conservator is for an adult. Other states split it so that a guardian manages the personal life of the subject, such as their medical treatment, residential placement, etc. And a conservator manages their assets, which is like their money and finances and property. And in other places, the two are used somewhat interchangeably. It's also very common for people to be under both a guardianship and a conservatorship at the same time, which I think is probably the primary reason that leads to those two words being used interchangeably. Um, but I will lean more towards saying conservatorship uh, for everything in this video for the sake of consistency, and also because that's the term that I think we're all colloquially used to. Now, conservatorships are most commonly used for young adults with intellectual disabilities and older adults with dementia, with an estimated 1.3 million people in the United States under a guardianship and or a conservatorship. And that's estimated because we don't actually keep solid data on that, which is a little bit concerning. Once they begin, they don't have an end date. Typically, they usually last for the rest of a person's life, but they're often for elderly people, so that's usually only a couple of years by the time somebody is incapacitated enough to um, need a guardianship or conservatorship, but not all the time, which is what we're going to talk about. Generally, the way that they work is that somebody will petition the probate court that a person, let's call them the subject, um, needs to have an appointed conservator or guardian. Anybody can petition to be the person for that subject, family, friends, their hospital, their nursing home, adult protective services, etc. and they must provide evidence that the subject is disabled and in need of assistance. The verbiage specifically used by the uh, Michigan Attorney General was that this needs to be proved specifically by reason of mental illness, mental deficiency, physical illness, disability, or chronic intoxication or chronic drug use. Once this petition has been filed, a court-appointed guardian ad litem will meet with the subject to let them know what's going on and inform them of their rights and make a report for the judge of relevant facts on the subject. Then a hearing happens and the judge will decide whether it's appropriate to appoint a guardian and or conservator it's not always guaranteed that the specific petitioner will be appointed as that guardian or conservator. It's possible the judge might decide that actually the subject should definitely be under conservatorship, but it would be better for a professional guardian or conservator um, to take over instead of that family member. This is especially common if family members cannot agree who should be the one in charge. Um, so the judge will just be like, great, then neither of you are in charge and a different person that you don't know at all is in charge instead. So. That is also a thing that can happen. Conservatorships are technically not allowed to be imposed on a subject if there is a less restrictive alternative available, which we'll discuss what those are later in this video, but it is also fairly easy to argue that somebody is incapacitated enough that this is what re is required. Um, rather than those less restrictive options that give more autonomy to the subject. And there is a whole lot of oversight when it comes to conservatorships, which is why we're here and we're talking about them right now, because this is a disability rights issue. Whether limited or unlimited, the result of a court ordered guardianship is to take away from an adult the power to make fundamental life decisions with respect to liberty, property, and one's own life. A guardianship order transfers that decision-making power to another adult or corporate entity. The deprivation can be as profound as the termination of the ward's life or the transfer of an entire estate so that the ward can be placed in a nursing home home to preserve the bulk of the estate for the heirs. In many ways, the deprivation of liberty through an involuntary guardianship order is greater than that suffered by a convicted felon. Prisoners retain basic rights to control medical decisions, bodily integrity, the right to conduct their business affairs, and retain their estate. Wards do not. When appropriate, a guardian or conservator can be of invaluable assistance to an incapacitated person. However, the wrong guardian or an inappropriate or premature guardianship can be the very act that triggers a chain of events leading to the unnecessary or premature institutionalization, causing the ward to give up hope. It may be the event that hastens death. Many of us would welcome someone who could serve the role of protector, defender, trustee, and guardian. Unfortunately, there is also the risk that the guardian will become our warden and gatekeeper. 
sorry to use such a massive quote, um, but she explained that better than I literally ever could. So I just, I had to include the whole thing. That's reminding me uh, via popcorn thought <laughs> that I forgot to do a video description. So I'm sorry about that. I'm a white person with uh, light brown curly hair that is just above shoulder length, uh, sitting in front of a plain wall with green leaves on it. And I am wearing a shirt that's like maroon and brown and it has deer on it. Sorry about that. I usually try to remember at the beginning and then I just fully didn't. Now, anyway, back to the topic at hand. Guardianships are also very expensive. There are lots of yearly hearings and reports and lawyers fees and all of that stuff have to be covered. And traditionally, the money for that all comes out of the subject's account. And since the guardian or conservator has access to the finances of the subject, they can charge the estate directly. With some people billing everything from writing a report to uh, going to court to opening your mail to assessing your mood. They can also decide where you will live. They can sell your car. They can take away your ability to vote or see your children. And they can put do not resuscitate orders on your medical files. Conservatorships are also notoriously difficult to get out of, even if the guardians agree to it because it involves establishing that the conservatorship is not necessary because the subject is able to make their own decisions. This is an issue because first of all, they haven't been allowed to make their own decisions for quite some time. And also they need to use their own funds to pay for their own lawyer, but then don't have access to their funds. So that can obviously be quite prohibitive. Um, but also because, as we know from the history of institutionalization, it is fairly easy to argue somebody is mentally incapable of something. And once that is agreed upon, it is near impossible to demonstrate that this person is not that because everything that comes out of their mouth is then judged through the lens of, well, they don't know what they're saying because they're not mentally capable. For a slightly unrelated example, but it does feel related, um, I recently reviewed a film called I Am Sam, which is about a developmentally and intellectually disabled father who was trying to keep custody of his child. And in the court proceedings, they were arguing that because he wasn't able to help his daughter with geography, homework and he had a hard time doing multiplication and he couldn't read above like a second grade level that meant that he is not a qualified parent and should not have custody of his child meanwhile there are tons of parents who cannot do either of those things and we do not classify them as incapable parents. We just only point this out as proof in this case because we are scrutinizing this disabled man. And we have this double standard with conservatorships as well where people make not so smart choices with their finances or struggle with their mental health all the time and nobody questions whether they're competent enough to handle the entirety of their life by themselves um, or whether they deserve basic civil rights. We don't question that. And we hold people trying to get out of conserva conservatorships to a higher standard of perfection that we do for everybody else, which is not only unfair, but also almost completely unattainable. It's almost like our court system is completely set up to fail marginalized people. Um, it is, however, not that surprising. Uh, weaponizing mental disability has always been a tool for coercive control. All you have to do in the US is say that somebody is mentally deficient and they can be sterilized against their will without any proof. Um, thank you to the 1927 Supreme Court case of Buck v. Bell, which we've spoken about before in my History of Eugenics video, which you can watch up here. We also see this with institutions where men with outspoken wives would send their wives off to the madhouse. Oppression in general tends to boil down to mental disability, justifying sexism by calling women hysterical and easily overwhelmed, justifying racism by saying people of other races are less evolved and therefore less intelligent, the poor are mentally deficient and they're unable to handle their money, which is why they're poor, queer people are mentally ill, etc. We've all seen these arguments all the time. Because once you define somebody as crazy, you can easily dismiss absolutely everything that they have to say and dismiss their humanity overall. In regards to conservatorships specifically, like historically, um, in 1908 the US government passed an act to protect the Native Americans that put a large percentage of them under conservatorships, giving the government the ability to move people off of the land and use these lands to mine for gas and oil. I would assume a similar justification was also probably used for uh, taking away native children and putting them in residential schools. Like, oh, the parents are incapable of parenting. We must take these kids away and give them a safer home. So you see how slippery of a slope this is and how easily the paternalism of racism and colonialism feeds into the abuse of conservatorships. I tried to find out the history of conservatorships and what we know about them historically. Um, the major thing that I found, uh, other than that article on the history of conservatorships in Native Americans was an article about how conservatorships as we know them today actually originated in ancient Rome, um, where women and children were the property of the man of the household because they were seen as vulnerable and incapable of making their own decisions. And if the man of the household died, they would appoint somebody else called a tutor or a curator, usually an uncle or other male relative, to take over. If women or children wanted to make any sort of financial decision or take any legal action, they required the approval and support of their curator. The assets and property of the subjects under the care of the tutor or curator also legally belonged to the tutor or the curator. We also know that magistrates had the ability to appoint a curator to do the same for mentally incapable people and also those who could not manage their finances properly. For male children, this ended when they were teenagers, though it could last until they were 25 years old, um, and for everybody else, it was permanent. Now, I don't know how much of US law is technically directly based off of Roman law. I know a solid chunk is, so this is very probably where we got this from, but also we've seen these social norms of control from males and households in like, 
all kinds of history all over the place. So I, I think this is a thing, um, I don't know specifically if the language of conservatorship or tutor or whatever uh, was used in those situations, but it does seem like this has been around for a while, which I think is super fascinating and also kind of weird. Um, I mean, a lot of disability welfare laws are very similar to the ones in England in the 1500s. So like, it's not it's not that weird that that a lot of our uh, legal concepts today are almost identical to old ones, but it it still feels weird to me. Anyway, that's the only history that I found. Um, but I also, I did make a video a while ago about disability and slavery and how many disabled slaves after emancipation were held by their masters under guardianships and forced to continue working long after slavery technically ended. So that is also a thing. And the fact that I didn't find that in my research, um, but I knew that from something else implies to me that I, there is more history out there that I'm just not aware of. But let's talk about a few high profile cases. And also for legal reasons, everything that I'm saying here is alleged. Great. Now, first we have Britney Spears. Jessica Cogan Fozard does a better job explaining the timeline in her video about how uh, free Britney is a disability rights issue than I am about to, so you should watch that also. Um, but basically, after Britney's completely understandable mental health breakdown after being harassed by a lot of paparazzi all the time in 2007 and 2008, she was held on two different involuntary mental health holds. These are known as a 5150 in the state of California. And her father, Jamie Spears, petitioned the court for a temporary conservatorship until she was mentally stable. At the end of the year, they claimed that she had early onset dementia in her 20s and they made the conservatorship permanent. They also added a co-conservator, LA attorney Andrew Wallet, to handle the finances. Under this conservatorship, Jamie had full control over Britney's life, including her ability to see her children, her ability to do anything without being monitored, um, ability to look at bank statements, vote, have children, drive her car, leave the house, speak about the conservatorship, hire her own lawyer. She also had an IUD that was placed so that she couldn't have any more children and she's not permitted to have it taken out. And if she didn't comply with any of these things, she could be legally incarcerated at a mental health facility. He also controlled her estate, meaning he tracked all of her purchases, he could sell her things, he could file restraining orders and restrict all of her visitors. He also controlled her business, meaning that he could force her to perform and go on tour and write music and do interviews, all of which made her money that she had no control over because he had control over all of that money. The Free Britney movement had been around since 2008, but became very popular in January 2019 when she was placed in a mental health facility for three months after being seen driving to get burgers with her boyfriend um, and testifying in court that she was being held against her will. A judge then opened an investigation to the legality of this conservatorship. In March of 2019, the lawyer co-conservator resigned and in April they checked Britney back into a mental health facility uh, and then a podcast in April of 2019 about Britney Spears released an episode about how she was being held captive, including insider information from a paralegal who was working for one of the attorneys on the conservatorship, followed by a cryptic like, everything's fine, don't worry about me, I just need a little bit of privacy, Instagram post from Britney, which then like blew up the internet. Um, and then in September of that year, Jamie asked to be released from managing her personal care and the court appointed a professional conservator. Um, he still managed her finances. There's also speculation that maybe he was still managing the other one as well. He just wasn't on it in name. Um, and then she made her first public statement in court in June of 2021, talking about how she was capable of managing everything herself and had severe trauma from the situation. Lots more legal battles ensued and the conservatorship formally ended in November 12th of 2021. I think Free Britney is how a lot of us learned about conservatorships from the beginning um, was because of this situation. I also discovered um, while researching this that Amanda Bynes was also in one that was filed by her parents in 2013 after a 5150 um, and her mother petitioned to end it in 2017. It was reinstated in 2019 after a relapse um, and that meant that Bynes was unable to marry her fiance in February of 2020 but her conservatorship uh, officially ended in March of 2022. Michael Orr who you may know from the famous film The Blind Side is another conservatorship situation we saw in the media fairly recently. This one is so interesting to me as a media reviewer because watching the film with the knowledge of how it actively rewrites history almost like media is powerful and has, has purpose. Wow. Um, but if you're not familiar with the film, it tells the story of Orr, an unhoused black teenager who ends up being taken in and then adopted by the white affluent Christian Tui family. He's a football prodigy. They help him keep his grades up so he can go get into college and go on a football scholarship. And then he ended up becoming a professional player in the NFL. Orr has complained for a while about how he was portrayed as not smart in the film. And there have always been discussions as to how much of a aggressively white savior story it is and also portraying him as unintelligent further stereotypes this character in a racist way that makes all white people look more like they've saved him and you get the whole white man's burden situation involved. But in August of 2023, Orr filed a 14 page petition in Tennessee stating that he had discovered that the Tui family had not legally adopted him when he signed what he thought was adoption paperwork in 2004. He alleges that they told him that they couldn't adopt him since he was over 18. So they were going to be his conservators, which meant the exact same thing as being adoptive parents and made him a part of the Tui family. It was just different because he was an adult. And so that's what his understanding was. Um, but instead they became his conservators, giving them legal authority over using his name and likeness, which was the 
then used to make the 2006 book and the 2009 film, as well as controlling his finances, education, and medical decisions. His petition was to end the conservatorship, bar the family from using his name and likeness, and require them to account all of the money they had made off of him and pay it back to him with additional damages. In response to Orr's petition, a Tennessee judge on Friday, September 29th, ended the conservatorship agreement, saying she was shocked it had ever been created because Orr was in his right mind and not physically disabled when he was asked to sign it, according to the Associated Press. The Tui family also released a statement through their lawyer, the same lawyer as Lizzo and Bill Cosby, just for the record, is a fact that I found. I do with that information what you will, um, alleging that they had always been upfront with him about the conservatorship agreement and Orr had told them that if he, they didn't pay him that he would release a negative story about them in the press. And I am happy that he's free and working to reclaim his story. Good for you, Michael Orr. Um, the most recent celebrity conservatorship that's been in the news, which is the reason that this video ended back up on my list of things to talk about, um, has been Wendy Williams. In 2022, the 59 year old was placed under temporary financial guardianship after her bank, Wells Fargo, acclaimed in a New York court she was an incapacitated person and the victim of undue influence and financial exploitation, according to The Hollywood Reporter. The Hollywood Reporter article also said that according to Williams' attorney, Williams suspected potential misconduct from her financial advisor and asked to see her financial records so she could potentially use them to switch banks. And Wells Fargo then petitioned for guardianship after that happened. Her team recently announced that she had been diagnosed with frontal temporal dementia and aphasia. And we also know that she has Graves' disease and a documentary about her made by her family aired at the end of February. In the trailer, her son specifically says, to be put in front of a judge and given a guardian, that was when they took her away from us. And William says, I have no money and I'm gonna tell you something. If it happens to me, it could happen to you. I would show you the clip here, but the YouTube copyright gods are a scary thing. Obviously there's a lot of speculation as to what is going on in the situation. There is a chance we might get more information between the time I make this video and by the time you see it. Um, but the conversations around conservatorships brought up by the situation are why I'm making this video. But let's talk about some alternatives for conservatorships. Ways to be proactive about them just in case, because that's really cool to know. And again, you should really watch the hour long webinar thing on YouTube from the Michigan Attorney General on this topic. It's really great and worth the time. Obviously things are different state to state. That's how things work, but it's just a general, um, even understanding it from a Michigan standpoint made me like, okay, I get things a little bit more about what I can expect from my state, you know? So check it out. It's, a, it's worth, it's worth the hour. The primary thing is to plan ahead. Be aware of all the options and have honest conversations with people close to you about what you want. The court exists to make decisions for us when we're not able to make these decisions for ourselves. So if we make clear in writing for ourselves what we want and need before we get to a point where we cannot express things like that independently, we are much less likely to end up at the whims of the court. It's also important to note that a diagnosis of early dementia or something else does not automatically mean a person is no longer, um, no longer has legal capacity because these things do fluctuate. So when in doubt, talk to an attorney which I acknowledge can be cost prohibitive um, and inaccessible, but my point still stands. When in doubt, talk to an attorney. And the first alternative to conservatorships is power of attorney. Assigning power of attorney can be done out of court. You go to a lawyer, you get it done, and you assign a person, and you should also have some backups um, who could take over for various things in the case that you are unable to do them. You can very much personalize that to your needs and desires so you can specify what you want and need and what things they will have control over, and they are unable, unlike in a conservatorship, to go against your wishes. If you are not legally capable and under the power of attorney, you do also have the ability to fire the person that you gave power to, but you also do not have the ability to draft a new legal document to pick a new one. Uh, so have some backups, <laughs> probably a good idea. The second alternative is a HIPAA release. Um, this creates the ability for medical teams to share personal health, health information with somebody else. So if you want somebody else to be able to help you understand your medical things or help you make decisions or be a backup person for the doctor to call, this is also a great option. I also forgot to mention this. Um, you can and probably should stack these alternatives. So if you want to do several at once, Good idea. The third is a supported decision-making agreement where you designate several people who are able to help you make legal decisions. This presumes the capacity of the subject and gives them the ability to consult family and friends and also retain their legal rights at the exact same time. Basically the way that it works is that a chosen person accompanies a subject to help explain what the different options are in a way that is accessible to them and can help advise them, but the decision is inevitably up to the disabled person at the end of the day. There are also uh, other things like trusts, which can be beneficial and also not beneficial depending on the situation that basically gives somebody else the ability to manage your assets Sets, both while you're alive and after you've passed away with more flexibility than with a living will. Um, a special needs trust specifically gives somebody the ability to save without getting kicked off of disability benefits as well, which is important. Living wills are also important. They specify end of life treatment requests. 
Um, and I saw some sources recommending other alternatives such as having joint property ownership and joint bank accounts with somebody else. And there's a thing called a representative payee who is a person approved by the Social Security Administration to help manage your Social Security benefits that you can also do. So those are also options. So there are lots of alternatives to conservatorships and guardianships that prioritize autonomy and the presumption of competence in the subject. Some of them require a little bit more forethought, but it is worth the time and effort to have forethought, even if it starts off as an informal conversation. I didn't, I forgot about this, but when I was making this video, for curious incident, since we were all disabled, uh, the core team of a couple of us actually did make a plan as to what would happen with the show were anything to happen to us, specifically me. We were like, what is our contingency plan? If this happens to Sydney, if this happens to Sydney, and if this happens to Sydney. And, and obviously this is a smaller scale thing, um, um, and it was not legal at all, but it was nice to know that we had that written down somewhere just in case. And we did almost need to invoke it at one point when Ace went to the ER. So I am glad <laughs> that we did have that. You never know when things are going to happen and it's always good to be proactive so that you can be sure that what you want ends up happening. But anyway, that's that's it. That's all I have for today. I know this wasn't the most uplifting or riveting of videos in the world. I wish I could tell you that we have like legislation in the works to fix this and everything's gonna be super great soon. That's not the case. I, it seems like there are a couple bills that are slowly creeping their way along to protect um, things and, and standardize things a little bit more, but that's the side of a legal system I don't totally understand. So I cannot confidently tell you anything about what's going on there. Um, <laughs> but either way, the more people that come out about their conservatorship stories, particularly celebrities, um, the more the people are paying attention to these things. And I do hope this turns into solid legislation soon. Um, and I'm really hopeful seeing all the people. I mean, it, it's sad. Obviously it's sad to see these people coming out about these stories, but I think that it is important that these things are becoming more in the in the cultural consciousness. Um, so yeah, either way, I hope that you learned something today. I hope that you maybe feel a little bit more empowered maybe. I know this feels a little scary and overwhelming that somebody could just go to court and take away all your rights without consulting you or you having to sign anything or say anything. But again, I'm, I'm really hopeful about these conversations becoming more mainstream. I also think this topic is a really good reminder as to how intertwined the fate of disabled people and elderly people is because I feel like we often separate the elderly from the disability label, which hurts both sides of the equation. Um, and also the important intersections of race and other oppression here as well because the paternalism of racism and the paternalism of ableism have very much fed into each other to create lots of uh, bad situations in regards to conservatorships and also many other things. Um, but anyway, yeah, as always, thank you for listening. Thank you for learning. Remember, it's never too late to start over and I look forward to seeing you, my dear, in the next one.